our 1000th episode is coming out in June. And I know you want to send me a present. You probably want to Venmo me some money or do something, but you don't have to do that. The best present you could give me is to go do a review. We are trying to get a thousand reviews of the podcast by the thousandth episode. If there's an episode that stands out to you, something that's impacted you, and you've never done a review for Practice of the Practice, head on over to your favorite place that you listen to the podcast and do a review. We are trying to get a thousand reviews by our thousandth episode. We'd love for you to go leave us a review for the Practice of the Practice podcast. This is the Practice of the Practice podcast with Joe Sanox, session number 993. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. I hope you are enjoying this series on psychedelic-assisted therapy. Uh, we've been covering a lot of things. Uh, we talked uh, early on in that very first episode about MDMA and overcoming trauma and anxiety with Jonathan Robinson. Uh, we talked about psilocybin-assisted therapy retreats with Catherine Warnock. Uh, then we talked about group uh, psilocybin and ketamine therapy with Carrie Haynes and and um, then in the last one, we talked about Ibogaine. Um, so all sorts of things that we've been digging into, whether or not this is something that you actually want to practice, I think it is very important for us as therapists, as social workers, counselors, MFTs, whatever you are, licensed or not, for us to just be educated. This is something that uh, so many people are talking about that even in my small northern Michigan communities, people have questions about and are wondering, and you know, we're seeing things change with the FDA, and there's just a lot going on. And if we are professionals in any capacity, I think it's so important for us to just be knowledgeable of this, whether or not you want to actually practice this work. Um, and if you do want to practice it, obviously, go get the good trainings, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that today uh, as well. Um, but also, just a few things before we dive into this episode. We are just a couple weeks away from our 1,000th episode. June 5th, our 1,000th episode comes out. We've got some big things planned for you. As you've been hearing uh, in our call to action before each episode up till now, we asked a bunch of you to submit some of your favorite things from the podcast. We're going to be putting that in. We're going to have some things around uh, our staff talking about their favorite moments of the podcast. Some of our favorite guests we're going to have uh, leave us messages. And uh, it's going to just be a really big celebration. But our goal, uh, and we are about a third of the way there, is to have a thousand reviews by our thousandth episode. And so uh, we would love to have you, if you've liked the show, and you want to just give back a little bit. We rarely ask you to go review the show, but we'd love for you to pull up whatever app you're in and put in a review of what you think of the show, what's your favorite episode been, things like that. Uh, so we don't ask that very often, but we're trying to get a thousand reviews by the thousandth episode. Uh, so I am so excited today. Uh, we are continuing this series with Consetta Trotsky, who is a founder of Mindfully Embodied, a private practice specializing in psychedelic assisted therapy, trauma, and somatic therapy. Consetta is currently researching and studying the integration of psychedelic therapies with somatic modalities. She's a MAPS trainee, a graduate of the psychedelic assisted therapy program at Naropa University, and a Pratty trained ketamine assisted therapist and co-facilitates plant medicine retreats internationally. Consetta, welcome to the Practice the Practice podcast. Hi, Joe. Thanks so much for having me. It's so good to be here. Yeah, I am so excited to have you here, uh, you know, to have people that are connected with MAPS and with these like international oversight and scholarly ways of thinking about this work. Um, it's really great to have someone like yourself who is really digging into not just, you know, the the science, but also, you know, the art of it and and kind of all that goes into integration. So thanks so much for being on the show today. Gosh, so exciting. And how grateful I am that you're highlighting this really important emergent piece of our of our work. So thank you for that. Yeah. So one thing I forgot to say in the intro that I usually say is my attorney wants me to remind everyone that many of the things we talk about on this are federally illegal. And uh, you're going to in a second talk about the scope of what you're going to talk about as well. Um, but make sure that you do your own checks and balances and look into how you want to practice and make sure that uh, you know that we're not telling you to go do illegal things. So instead <laughs> of you wanted to also kind of just talk about your scope of what you're going to be talking about, just to make sure that we you know, say what we're supposed to say before we dive in. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So right now, the practice with psychedelics is um, in, in emergent legalities across the country, depending on what state you're in. Um, but yeah, my focus will really be integration today and really looking at how important of a piece that is. The work and the practice that I'll speak about in terms of other plant medicines um, has either been done or received in countries where this is legal currently. Um, and so it is really, uh, yeah, important that we stay with that piece for now and know that uh, that there might be po different possibilities emerging soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we get into some of those terms, like what is integration and, and mm -hmm. all of that that we're going to be talking about, I'd love to hear, how did you get into doing psychedelic assisted therapy? Like, how did that get on your radar and be something that you not only, you know, maybe were interested in, but said, like, I want to get more training and I want to like do research. Like, how did all that start to emerge for you? Yeah, such a beautiful question. Uh, it started for me from my own um, sort of health health needs, things that I was working on within my own body, things that were feeling important energetically and somatically. So my background has always been in somatics. I'm a dance movement therapist and a drama therapist, and I'm also somatic experiencing trained. So looking at really what is happening in the body as an energetic manifestation, including emotions and thoughts, those are also energetic frequencies. So when I had something personal happen to me, um, a health challenge that was coming through, I really understood through that lens that there was energetically something happening and felt for whatever reason, the call to go and work with plant medicine out of the country and um, had a lot of success with that myself and actually healed the, the thing that I was working on. And again, I'm not purporting that these medicines can be healers um, for any illnesses, but for me, it really was something that in conjunction with lifestyle changes and therapy and other pieces, I was able to integrate into my own life and make some really beautiful lasting changes. When I realized that was possible, I was just you know, really blown away this entire other chapter of what's possible in my work, of what brought me joy, of what ignited me. And I wanted to bring that into the community. And it happened to coincide with this psychedelic renaissance that's happening in, in the world. And so it felt really kismet timing wise that that would be something that I would shift my focus to. And it, it really felt like an extension from the somatic work I was already doing, as well as my history with mindfulness, meditation, Buddhism, and yoga, which I've been practicing for over 20 years. And so it really felt like um, a symbiotic extension of the work that I was already doing coming from a personal place. Wow. Now, tell me a little bit about, I want to define some terms and how you use it uh, for our audience. So um, when you talk about integration, for those that are brand new to this work, how would you define integration? Integration is the place where it's the bridge between the, the experience with the medicine, with whatever psychedelic medicine you're working with. Integration is the bridge between the psychedelic medicine experience or the ceremony or the journey, the time that you're ingesting the medicine and the rest of your life. <laughs> so it's a really important piece. It's it's the bridge between the, the however many hours you're sitting taking the medicine and how you're going to integrate and apply the incredible messages and information that are gifted to you and that you're also exploring from within yourself in order to make the lasting changes that you're probably wanting to make and why you're finding yourself taking this medicine in the first place. So the integration is the place where we learn how to take what has happened in ceremony and translate it into lasting behavioral and cognitive changes. Mm, I love that. You know, just, you know, little thing like changing your life outside of the medicine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I do want to dig into kind of what that looks like and some of the research of like how you're applying that. But I also want to hear a little bit more before we get into that on how you're integrating that with somatic therapies? Yeah, I love that question. Somatic therapies are uh, really uh, connected to, again, the experiences that we have in our life. You might have heard the saying that your biology is your biography. So when we experience things, we lodge them in our systems. And those of us that are working with trauma or that are familiar with traumatic impact knows that the trauma really lives in our nervous system. It stays behind in our autonomic nervous system and, and creates um, a block or a loop or some kind of incomplete energetic expression in our system. So physiologically, we're not able to move in the flow and the expansion that's our birthright. And we end up feeling like we're repeating patterns of behaviors that are 
for whatever reason, eluding us. We can't stop smoking or drinking or whatever our thing is. We're thinking negatively, these cognitive um, loops that we get stuck in. And so the somatic piece is, for me, a way of working directly with the nervous system to help even beyond and transcend the narrative of what happened, to look at the lasting impact in the body in the present moment of what happened in the past. When we can work directly with that energy, we can start to open and clear those energetic loops and blocks and feel whole, feel more cohesive and have an expansive experience in our system. Often that can lead to cognitive changes and behavioral changes kind of organically because it's really our, we're not meant to live in stuck looping states. So the somatic piece is helping to work directly with the body and that's through mindful awareness and through breath through movement, through imagery, through subconscious guidance. So if there's something coming through subconsciously, dreams, thoughts, um, images that are connected to sensations, it's not dismissing those as something superfluous and instead it's centering those as the place where we will see and make the change. Mm. I would love for you to walk us through um, when you're thinking through integration, when you're thinking about the research and applying that, like, what does it look like for you working with a client, you know, say the month or two, like when they first reach out to you all the way through the ceremony and then the integration afterwards? Like, I think for a lot of people, they just don't even know how that works. And it would be really helpful to just hear how, how that works from your perspective. Yeah. So often, so I get clients from all different stages of this work. Uh, if someone's coming to me, they've had a ceremony somewhere, um, they're feeling a little bit lost or they're not understanding what happened in ceremony or they're feeling sometimes even disturbed because often the work with these medicines can be jarring or overwhelming or it can ask us to expand in a way uh, cognitively or energetically that we may not be ready for or, or used to. And that's kind of the point so that there's change happening there. But when a client comes to me after having had a ceremony, my work then as an integration specialist is to help really ground and anchor the imagery, the thoughts, the experiences, the emotions that emerged into what that client went into, hopefully with an intention. Intentions are really important to go into a ceremony with a clear intention, will help direct the subconscious and help direct the energy towards what it is that you're working on. Often that can get confusing or lost in ceremony, depending on the medicine that someone is working with. Um, there can be a lot of overwhelm. Uh, some people have come to me working with a medicine called ayahuasca, which is practiced in Peru and other countries. Uh, that medicine can be very potent and very um, abstract. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Mm. So it's almost like watching these, these images or these, these experiences. And, and if you don't have a framework or a context to understand what those images and experiences might be trying to communicate or share with you, it can be easy to either forget them, dismiss them, or just feel lost. So my work as an integration specialist, regardless of the medicine, is to really help to, to, first of all, validate that everything that comes through in ceremony is intentional and on purpose, that there are intelligences here working in these medicines that are complementary to our own, but often not, not the same. So we, so again, to work as a bridge or an interpreter between what the medicine consciousness and intelligence is showing, what your subconscious, your own subconscious is showing, how your nervous system is interpreting that, and then you're hel helping to move all of that information into your prefrontal, into your cognitive lobe so that we can begin to make sense of it, I'm trying to get some kind of logical framework around it. And then at the same time, honor the mystery that's happening there as well. Yeah. So when you're when you're doing the research around this, and you know when Maps is um, looking at best practices, what are some of the things that are being discovered or being tested and evaluated in regards to kind of best practices around the integration? Yeah. So integration, uh, one of the one important pieces is not to interpret. So even though I just said interpret and translate, it really is um, client centered. So one of the pieces is not to imbue your own subjective interpretation of what's happening for a client. 
um, either a subjective or two objective, kind of like those dream books. I don't know if you remember, maybe they still have them. These dream books that are like, if you dream of a flower, it means you're blossoming or something. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. there isn't like, there isn't like an image that, that means the same thing for everyone at all. And one of the best practices is to really center the client's nervous system, meet the client where they're at, um, help the body be the guide. So if someone's, someone is feeling overwhelmed or if they're feeling that they are um, lost or emotionally stressed, helping to ground, making sure that there's resources, grounding uh, mechanisms, and that can look like breath, breath work, that can look like helping, you know, find, find ways to center through grounding in the, in the present moment, helping to also uh, empower the client to know that they are the ones in charge of this experience, because often going in with surrender to the medicine intelligence can feel overpowering uh, and can feel disempowering. And so it's helpful to keep the client centered and to keep the client in a place where they are the ones with the autonomy and with the agency. It's important to also, as a best practice, understand the framework of the diagnoses that the client is coming you coming to you with. In terms of integration, they've already sat with the medicine, so I'm going to make sure that I'm understanding who I'm working with. I'm doing a collaboration with their therapist if they do have one. And then also if it's prior to the to the medicine sit, to not be working with certain diagnoses to make sure people are medically stable and clear and to make to hold all of that ethical space, you know, in terms of what someone is going to be getting and optimizing in their experience. So first it's do no harm and making sure that we stay in alignment with that. So some of the, the research is showing that when there is good, you know, when there's uh, grounding on board, when there is support system on board, when there is a cognitive framework that's helpful to reference, and then also taking it, you know, meeting the client where they're at, taking it slow, not moving faster than the speed of their nervous system, allowing there to be that trust, that rapport, staying curious, staying open, and not imbuing the experience with some you know, staying in a place of humility as their as their integration specialist, not being someone who thinks they know better. And then also my, and I don't know if MAP says this, but my experience is that if you don't know the medicine or haven't worked with the medicine yourself, educate, at least with integration, educate yourself as much as you can. If you have the ability to work with that medicine, um, I wouldn't say go work with the medicine in order to support someone, but if you have already experience with that medicine, choose those medicines to integrate with, um, to be, mm. to help someone integrate with, because then you know, you know, the other person's experience as much as you can from, from that medicine. So those are some of the guidelines that come to mind. Yeah. Imagine the impact you could have with your clients when you are able to practice the most cutting edge modality available today. Psychedelic therapy is the future of mental health care and the Integrative Psychiatry Institute will empower you with the tools and knowledge you need to master this exciting modality. IPI's comprehensive training and in-person experiential practicums will elevate you both personally and professionally. This in-depth curriculum is the gold standard certification in the field. When you join, you will step into a global community of thousands of innovative colleagues who are integrating psychedelic therapy into their practices. Visit psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply, where you will find all the information you need about IPI's training. And when you visit psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply, you will also receive IPI's free e-report on the current state of psychedelic therapy so you can get the most up-to-date information immediately. Again, that's psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply to learn more about the training and get your free report. Now, I know in lots of communities, there may not be people like yourself that, um, you know, have done a lot of this work around integration. And, you know, there may be even therapists listening where, you know, they're surprised by a client who says, hey, I just did a therapeutic psychedelic journey or, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a solo journey with a sitter or whatever. You know, people might be surprised by it. Can you go through some kind of do's and don'ts? And you kind of just hit on some of these, like, you know, don't interpret it and things like that. But what are some more do's and don'ts if a therapist um, kind of gets themselves in where one of their clients is wanting to integrate um, and maybe hasn't reached out to a specialist in the area? 
Uh, when should someone refer out? When should someone you kind know, of use just active listening? Like take us through, you know, if someone, you know, is is in a session where they're basically integrating, but they don't have that training, what are some of the do's and don'ts in that session? Yeah, that's a really great question. One of the definitely do's is to stay curious, stay open, ask a lot of questions. If this is a client you already know and have worked with for a long time, that's actually a huge benefit. So you can refer back to what you already understand about that client's developmental process, their relational patterns, what it is that they're working on, all of that stuff counts big time. So being able to refer back and and ask, well, how does this connect to you know, this relational piece that might've happened or what are the emotions that are coming through? So do stay curious about the emotional experience. For me, Joe, emotions are really the guide map to so many things. They unlock so many doors and I wonder how many times they may be overlooked. My clients know well and have made lots of jokes, have bought me earrings and pillows with this feelings wheel. So I've got feelings wheel stuff going everywhere and it can be so helpful to identify what emotions are coming through or came through for you in that sit. You don't even have to go into the actual symbiology or experience of the sit. You can look at the emotional information that came through. You can look at the lived experience that's happening in front of you in your client's nervous system and work from there very effectively. You can help them parse out what is the residue that is happening now? What is it that that shifted for me? So you can ask those types of questions. What shifted for you? How do you feel different now than you did when you started? How does that feel familiar to you? Really tracking the ways that this client's experience is showing up in front of you within the context of their lived life. It's not that they're going to be a new person or somehow be, you know, working in ways that that are, are completely out of your capacity. So you can still meet them exactly where they are at and use the therapeutic alliance and the rapport that you have to help them understand what's happening for them now. What I what I would offer is that I had a client, for example, refer to me, they were um, They were really, they were struck by an image that came through in one of their journeys with ayahuasca and felt that they were going to die and that they were perhaps having um, cancer. So they were very afraid and it was jarring their nervous system to the point where they were looping back to the imagery that the, the ayahuasca had shown them. Their therapist wisely referred them out to me because then I could help, because their therapist doesn't know that medicine. So I could help them sort of rem- place that imagery within the context and framework of how that specific medicine works and to help normalize their experience and then to continue what I just shared to parse out again, well, where does that work for you in your life now? How is that familiar? What are the emotions that are coming through for you? And then returned them to their therapist. And we actually continue to work together, the three of us really well. So that's a uh, that's an example of where referring out. So I, I would say if you start to feel in your own system as a therapist that you're unclear where to go, you're feeling like mm, this is territory that feels unfamiliar to me in a way that I feel like I can't serve my client, then seek out a referral. I'm always available. If if I can't see them, I will refer out uh, or help find. There's a network of people that, that can, you know, we refer to each other because this work is so, at this moment, you know, kind of, I don't want to say rare, but yeah, it's not as common as, as it will be potentially in the future. So I'm available for that. But if you start feeling like there's something happening here that's medicine specific, or I start uh, wondering what I should say and I'm uncertain, uh, that might be a time to share that with your client and then refer them out. Um, Even if it's just for a couple of sessions, it can be really grounding for that client to hear from someone who understands that work, that world, normalizes, validates, and allows that information then to be integrated so that they can go back to their regular therapy work with some new insight, which is the whole point. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned um, that person that thought they had cancer. I think a lot of times people have these big insights or they might have um, feel like they need to make big decisions, uh, monumental decisions, however however we frame it. Um, What's your thoughts or advice or how do you handle when someone says, the medicine told me to leave my spouse or the medicine told me I need to move to Canada or the medicine told me whatever. Um, you know, I know with some medicines, may, it may feel that way. It's definitely the person set and setting and a lot of things can be parsed out from, from 
the simplification I just had with that question. But when, when people have big things that are big decisions, like as an integrator, how do you handle that? <laughs> yeah, first, uh, first rule, do nothing. <laughs> do nothing big, at least for three to six months is my... Is do my... nothing for the person that you're... So as an integrator, you're saying to that person, don't do anything major for three to six months. Yes, absolutely. Okay. No major life changes for three to six months. It doesn't mean the information isn't interesting, but it means that you haven't had a chance to integrate that information into your uh, into your system, into your, into your prefrontal, your prefrontal cortex, into your, like the, and to really consider the impact because in that way, I really feel that the person is, I don't want to, I, I, I'm maybe cheating is a good, cheating themselves out of the entire process of what that information is really sharing with them and, and really cheating themselves out of the, the experience of their own empowerment, their own agency and integrating that information with, where and how it might be applicable in their own lives so that it's their choice. Anytime I hear the medicine told me X, Y, Z, now who's the one who's making these decisions? And is that something in that client's life that might be a, a, a relational pattern? That's, you know, or have they grown up being told what to do? Have they listened to others or been in some way submissive and pushed their own experiences to the side? I would get curious about that kind of phrase. The medicine told me to. Well, what do you feel? What do you think? How are you receiving that? Is that something that's interesting to you? What's it like to be told that by something that you're discovering or learning? Are you gift gifting that information, some kind of authority at the cost of your own? So that's how I would go around that kind of question. And then at the same time, um, help support the understanding of how that information feels. You know, maybe they do need to leave their spouse, but they need to really, in my experience, understand where that's coming from, why they would be doing that, and make that decision from a place of their own heart and body, and not because someone or something else told them to do that. Mm, so wise. Now, there might be people listening saying, you know, I want to help people integrate. That sounds amazing. Um, where would they get started with even, you know, getting extra training? Are there ways that you can kind of dip your toe in the water um, that you can, you know, train alongside people? Like, what does that look like for, for people that are hearing this and saying, I'm intrigued, I'm, you know, pre-contemplation, <laughs> kind of not sure if I want to do this, but I want to learn more. Uh, like, obviously, this series is a resource, but what other resources or things should they think through if they're interested? Yeah, if they're interested, I think that's great. You know, if you're interested, notice that there's something there. Um, you know, if it's possible to work with a medicine and, and within the scope of legality of wherever you are, and you feel called to experience something in that way, if that's part of it, then then that then that could be a beautiful resource and a place to start. If if experiencing the medicine is not interesting and instead it's it's integration only, then one of the things, so there's a couple of programs out there that people can apply to. And I, and I, when you said dip your toe, some of these programs are not, they're not cheap and they're lengthy. So it depends on how big a toe or how deep they want to dip it. Um, but there are, there's a program right now, I think MAPS has lined up with a place called Numinous and they have an intro, uh, intro course to psychedelic medicine. And they touch on the integration piece in there, like you said, the do's and the don'ts. And a lot of that is really about holding space and understanding how to hold space and understanding how to stay curious and understanding how to stay in surrender and humility, most of which we already hopefully do anyway as therapists. But then that additional piece of understanding how each medicine can work, knowing that there are different nuances or flavors depending on the medicine, that can be helpful if they want to like to do a training like this. So there's a numinous training and MAPS has aligned with them as the foundation now training so that when and if, but when the FDA approves the MDMA, that would be the first level of training that any therapist would need anyway to become MAPS certified. So that's one resource. Um, another one is I would get, I would connect with other integration therapists and, and talk with them, ask them questions see what's interesting to them, spend some time staying curious, maybe even, you know, speaking if there are people who have journeyed with medicine and what's helped them integrate. 
if there's a, if you're a therapist with a somatic background or if you work with trauma EMDR EMDR is a great example of imagery that can come through in the moment in the modality and we stay curious you know we're like oh follow that what's happening next so that is something that can you can also apply um, in terms of the integration is, is staying in a place of curiosity. I'm working on a, uh, a training course actually now that will help for this reason exactly, because I get so many calls and questions and then I'm like, well, like maybe I should just make something to help people at least have the, a basic framework. It can do wonders for confidence and at least knowing, okay, I can refer back to these specific points. Um, so that'll be out at the end of next year. I'm, I'm also doing another training for ketamine, um, how to hold space for ketamine is assisted therapy here in Dallas, because a lot of therapists don't know really what to do with that either in terms of integration. So I know that's me. I don't know um, right now of any other courses like that, but I'm sure they're out there. So I would, I would look that up as well. Oh, awesome. The last question I always ask is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Hmm. I would want them to know that they can create their practice according to the most blissful expansion of their own heart, so that their practice is possible, that their practice can be an extension of their own joy, of their own life, of their own of their own gifts, and that that is possible. You can create a private practice that is an extension of you, and that will be your best, most highest offering to the world. It doesn't have to look any kind of way. And if there's anything you're doing that's making you feel dense or heavy or you're unsure about continuing that in your practice, get curious about what it would, might look like to change that. So your practice is possible. Mm, I love that. Uh, if people want to connect with you, if they want to follow you and maybe when these different trainings come out, uh, where should we send them? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Right now, I have a, an archaic website <laughs> that I have in the process of updating, um, but it is functional. It is mindfullyembodied.org. I'm really excited. I actually waited until I had this sense of uh, therapeutic direction that I have now so that I'm you know investing into a, a better website, but there'll be... Uh, there'll be one, there'll be information posted there. And you can also find me at Mindfully Embodied on Instagram. Those are the two best places. Mm, so awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for highlighting this important work. I appreciate it. This series is just uh, so fulfilling. Uh, I'm so excited uh, to just have us learning together as a community. Um, and as many of you start to think more about um, just what this looks like for you, um, it's just really exciting to think about. Um, also, like, don't forget, we are headed towards our 1,000th episode, and we are hoping to have 1,000 reviews by our 1,000th. So if you have not pulled out your phone and done a review, would love for you to do that. Uh, if you enjoy this show, that is so helpful um, to just having people say, oh my gosh, like this show is great. Um, tell us what your favorite episode is. If you're like me, you like to gather a lot of information before you make a new decision, like adding a new modality to your practice. That's why I'm so excited that our sponsor for this series, the Psychiatry Institute, has put together an amazing e-report called The Current State of Psychedelic Therapy. You can get that totally for free over at psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply. That's where you can get that free report, The Current State of Psychedelic Therapy, again over at psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one. <laughs>